What's going on, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to a brand new episode of the Cannon Fire Podcast here on YouTube and iTunes. Coming back at you for episode five. I am your host, Redicus, joined alongside the best in the business, Mr. Bucks Football, Evan. Evan, how are you doing today, my man? Great. How are you? I'm doing just fine. And ladies and gentlemen, we're on a little bit of roll here. We have another uh, we have another guest on the show this week. And representing BeautyReport.com, he is a beat reporter. Ladies and gentlemen, our guest this week, Mr. Trevor Sikama. Mr. Trevor, thank you for being on the show. How are you doing tonight, man? Yeah, I'm doing good, guys. Good to be with you. All right. So let's jump right into things. No nonsense. Let's get into episode five here on YouTube and iTunes. Sorry about the uh, sorry about the little bit of breaking content on iTunes, guys. Um, actually, I'll be honest. I didn't pay the bill on uh, indication service. When I paid the bill, but everything is good to go. You gotta keep the lid on, man. Uh, I, I, I keep the lid on. Actually, the, uh, we sent a last two feet. I mean, that's not too bad. Our average episode, we run 30. 40 minutes, it's 50 megabytes, we put maybe 5 megabytes a month if we do it regularly, but I don't know, man, what happened this month, we just, well, I guess we got caught up on ourselves, we did a longer episode, and I had to pay some bills that I wasn't expecting to pay, so the vacation had to sit on the back burner, but I do apologize, we are back up and running on YouTube, iTunes, YouTube never went away, uh, but Mr. Trevor, tell us a little bit about yourself, I do know you're representing Beauty.com. Uh, you're over there, but tell us a little bit about yourself, some background, and what you can do over there for something you familiar. Yeah, sure. So, uh, I am in London, Florida, journalism for a So, uh, I've been fortunate to watch the Gators office every year for the last few years. I can for a couple of years. I'm from a tent area, actually down from Brayton, which is you're from the area of the Canterbury area, so next to it. So, uh, Bucks football, Bucks are I've grown up my whole life, you know, I've had the opportunity to nation for a year to cover uh, the team from that perspective. And then I was there, got noticed by Mr. Scott Reynolds, who was my boss over at PeopleReport.com. Um, somehow turned uh, this little sports reporting thing into a full-time gig. So, my first year covering the team, Full time started back in January, um, and yeah, I mean that's what we do. We're we're kind of a three man band. Myself, Scott, and and Mark Cook covering the Bucks, uh, both home and away. Whatever they're doing, we're on top of it. So it's been a blast so far, and, and I get to do a lot of cool stuff, like come on podcasts like this, man. So uh, the last year has definitely been a blast for me. Pleasure to have you here, man. And we actually got to complete the trilogy. We did have Mark on the show uh, th- about this time a year ago. It was a different format of a show a year ago, but regardless, we had him there. It counted. But uh, you got we talked, good. yeah, we talked about the uh, we talked about the Buck season preview in 2016. It was right at the end of the preseason. It was a good show. Go check it out if you have not already, guys. Um, unfortunately, we kind of know how the Bucks did in 2016, so the episode doesn't carry much weight. But if you like <laughs> listening to Mark over the phone, it's a very good episode. Uh, budget cuts were pretty bad back then, <laughs> but. Let's jump right into it, Evan and Trevor and myself. We are talking the Bucks, and it's a little bit of a sad day. If you guys have not been keeping up, uh, I don't know who you are, but if you've been living under a rock, as you may or may not know, Hurricane Irma has been approaching Florida off of the Gulf, not the Gulf Coast, the Atlantic Coast, and it's just been getting stronger and stronger every day. Meteorologists look at it. I believe it was a Category 5 as of, I think, 11 last night, somewhere around there. They're, they're, looking, to, they're looking to hope that it, that it misses wide right, but we'll see what happens. Anyways, due to this hurricane business, the season opener for the Miami Dolphins taking on the Tampa Bay Bucks in Miami was rescheduled to November 19th, 2017, and it will take place Week 11 in both of those teams' bye weeks. So... That move by the NFL, as we can clearly tell, it went over like a fart in church. 
It just wasn't something that the fans were looking forward to, and it's something that a lot of people really haven't found justification in. The only justification, and of course, the only justification I've seen from fans is that people say these players have families they have to look after, they have people they need to make sure are safe, and that is completely true. The, the, I've said it a hundred times, everyone has said it a hundred times. The game of football is not bigger than the safety of you and those around you, but... There are dozens of time slots, and there are many of neutral places that this game could have been played. And to go out there and, I, I wouldn't say ruin these teams two seasons, but, you know, stick a knife in their back by taking away their only bye week. Uh, let's jump into it, man. But, uh, Evan, how are you feeling about this? Yeah, uh, I, I agree. It is it is like putting a knife uh, into their back. Um, I wanted... Uh, and I'm pretty sure most of the fans and even most of the players wanted uh, this to happen. I wanted it to be a neutral site. Uh, I'm not sure if some of you know. I'm not sure if Trevor knows. But uh, I'm uh, about 45 minutes outside of Philly. I'm not in Tampa or anything like that. So uh, if it was to come to Philly, uh, I definitely would have been there. So I was, I was sort of rooting for it to come to Philly. Uh, if that would have been a possibility, which uh, it seemed like it was because uh, when, when Coach Cutter w was asked about it, a uh, possible neutral uh, location today, he he stated Pittsburgh and, and Philadelphia as uh, two of the places they were considering. Uh, I thought it could have been played on Sunday in Philly. Uh, obviously, we don't know all the details of that, of what they would have to do. Uh, unfortunately, yeah, this hurts both teams, you know, they only get one bye week for a year. They, you know, they really look forward to it. The players, the coaches, uh, just a, just a chance. You know, they're they're uh, they're really going hard all training camp, um, then regular season, and they get a bye week now gone. Uh, even though I guess you could technically say that their bye week is this week, but I tell you, uh, they're going to be really well rested for uh, Chicago. But uh, as for the Dolphins, you know, it hurts them too. Uh, and, it, you know, the biggest thing to me is that it, it puts the, the chance of injury. Uh, I think it puts the, the risk of injury a bit higher because of uh, the guys playing 16 straight games with really no rest. Um, you know, I guess the only way to get rest is if uh, the Bucks are up big in a game and they got to put in some of the backups towards the end. So that's what we're hoping. But, um, you know, it definitely hurts. I, I hope that this team can uh, can get past it, but uh, you know, and I have all, all the faith in Cutter that uh, he'll be able to to think of a plan uh, to keep his players uh, as rested as as they need to be. Um, what are your thoughts, Trevor? So, I mean, from the I guess you know, like inside the walls of One Buck Place, I'll just say that you know, last week when, or really just a couple of days ago when they were asking Cutter about the situation, about possibly losing the bye week, you could tell in his facial expressions, he was like, uh, no, like, we're not we're not doing that. We're not losing the bye. And I would just say that, you know, after them meeting with the NFL, having the conversations with, with them and the Miami Dolphins and everything, he came out today in the press conference, because uh, this is Wednesday here, the day that we figured out the news, and his tune was a lot different. Um you know, we asked him about losing the bye week, kind of his thoughts about it, and and I know that he's had some days to kind of get collected about it and maybe give a little bit more of a PR answer, but he said it is what it is, that this is bigger than football. And he said that, you know, to when he talked about moving it to a neutral site game, and that was something that I, I, I thought of as well. I thought that there's no way that you can keep this game anywhere in the southeast if you're moving it. Um, so I thought that, yeah, Indianapolis, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh – those were the places that you would have to go for it. Um, and and I, I thought about the logistics of it, you know, what it's like putting on a game, how much money that they would make, all of that. You know, I was tweeting out over the last couple of days, you know, the money doesn't matter. The money shouldn't matter. Um, it's getting these players out. But then the part that I didn't think of more until late, later in the process, you know, last night when, it was, when I was really kind of getting into it and thinking about what the NFL should do, to expect the players, um, especially the Dolphins and – that is a point that I think Bucks fans are missing big time is that I know that it hurts the Dolphins. And there are some players on the Dolphins who probably would have said, no, 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 let's go play at a, gift, a, at a different location this week. But if you look at the track of the hurricane right now, that thing is going to be a Category 4 hurricane, and it's hitting right next to Miami at this point. 
Can you can you honestly tell the players of the Miami Dolphins to go play a meaningful regular season football game? Back of their mind? Love, um, a different sport. They, like their community, he wasn't feasible because it was reason to expect these guys to have a mentality. A day we've been playing the game Sunday, you know, and Sunday before the game, I'm checking the phone. All the videos pouring in, the hurricane possibly ravaging. That's just happening. And I, I don't think it would be fair to play 16 games in a row. It's more than put it before them. Definitely, yeah. Definitely good. As you said, as plenty of times, this is football. My only thing that. Like the bad guy, and I don't, I don't disagree with it by any means. But it's the NFL. The NFL has so much control and what happens when, who goes where, who plays, things like that. We could have played the game overseas. I have, I would have had no problem. I would have had no problem. I would have not have been posed. I would not have been posed if they were to make a Thursday game. A double header for one night. I would not be opposed to two Thursday games in a season than just to skip the bond altogether. Because they're prepared for two games in a season. It's still a process. It's still a part. It's still something that they go through every season. A short week is something that every team goes through every season when they play the Thursday night game. To have two of those, yes, it's a little unfair, but at the same time, at least they do get that bye week still. And I just feel. I look at it as more could have been – there could have been more thought put into the decision. I think the decision was a a little rushed, and time was a factor. You know, the storm is coming in. You don't know exactly when it's going to hit. Some people are saying Sunday. Some people are saying Friday night, which probably isn't going to be the case. Others are saying Saturday, whatever. Time could have been a factor, but I, I still believe there should have been a little more consideration uh, that went into this decision. But – yeah, you know. Yeah, it is, no, I, it is what it is. I, I hear you, and it definitely, you know, it is what it is. You know, we can discuss it, and I'll, we'll probably be discussing it for the next couple of days. Because guess what? You know, we ain't got nothing else to talk about. So, <laughs> um, I mean, I definitely see your point. Uh, you know, c- certainly, um, the player safety thing uh, with, with playing sixteen games in a row. But you know, I will say, you know, we asked Jameis Winston. And I know, don't I know? I know Jameis Winston's a twenty three year old kid. It's a little bit different from him than a thirty year old, but. They asked him, you know, is it unsafe to play 16 straight games in a row? And Jameis laughed at the question. You know, the question that we had been asking every other player in the locker room about it. And, you know, they kind of they gave their vanilla answers. You know, Chris Baker was a little bit more opposed to it than than others. And then we get to Winston at the end of the day, and he kind of laughs. And he said, no, it's football. That's what we get paid to do. You know, whether you're playing 16 in a row or, again, like right here, it would have been 10 in a row and then, and then six after that. So it's... Now, people were saying, you know, they're not technically taking an, away, an advantage away from the Bucks because it was already there. Um, but I will just say that if there is a silver lining, maybe, that that game, that they're that week that they play the Patriots in Week 5, they play on a Thursday. They then don't play again until the, the following Sunday after that. So that is a 10-day break. And I know it's not exactly a bye week. You know, the schedule is not exactly the same, things like that. But... There are teams in the NFL who have their bye week as early as week six. And so a bye week is only three days less than, say, the break that the Buccaneers would be getting at the same time. And so is it unfortunate for the Bucs because this was on our schedule as a possible advantage to get really two points of rest during the year? Yes, it, it is now something the Bucks fans are certainly not happy about because it was there. But it is not completely unfair knowing the fact that teams do have a week six bye, and the Bucks kind of have a, I guess, a little bit more than a mini week six bye to go along with this. Um, uh, I'll get a, comfortable, with a comfortable break. Sure, yeah, yeah. And I, I know that, you know, later in the year is when you're dinged up. But again, you know, 
this was a scheduling advantage that they had on the Bucks schedule, and now it's not there. Um, that just is what it is, I think. Uh, they made the decision that they had to make in the time that they had to make it because they had to make sure that people had enough time to either get out of the state or get enough water or gas or board up their house or all these things because we, we forget, man, this, these take a lot of time. So uh, I guess, you know, they kind of made the decision that they had to make. It's unfortunate, truly, but dealing with a hurricane is an unfortunate situation. And so um, I can't be, I would just say that I can't be too mad at a decision that gives people the most chance to be safe in a natural disaster. So that's that's kind of my thought there. Uh, I can tell you one person we can blame for all of this is Jay Cutler. Look at what he has brought to Miami. <laughs> <laughs> either that or i uh i did see a picture the other day on facebook it said hurricane irma is our punishment as floridians for not using our turn signals and i actually i laughed at that one for a good few minutes but hurricane irma or uh hurricane irma excuse me hurricane irma has led to the rescheduling of the bucks dolphins season opener to week 11 there's nothing we can do about it now but complain but <laughs> moving on big developments on the depth chart another thing that Unless you're living under a rock, you may have seen it on the news. The Buccaneers did pick up three-time Pro Bowler and Super Bowl 50 champion of the Denver Broncos, TJ Ward at the safety position. A lot of people are very excited about this pick. And with all the rumors that we've had with trades and deals over the past preseason, I saw the potential of picking up a player like TJ Ward, and it went right over my head. I said, oh, it's not going to happen. We talked about it on an episode of the show before. I think it was episode two or three. I want to say three. There was a rumor going around a trade for LaShawn McCoy and Doug Martin and I think a sixth or seventh round draft pick or, or a good a good round draft pick. Nothing ever came of that. I know there was another trade talking about um, uh, Joe Hayden. Joe Hayden was on the uh, yep. Joe Hayden was on the on the topic block for a little while. That only lasted a few hours. The Steelers did snag him, but we simply didn't have the money to pay him. But TJ Ward, a, a pick that surprised the hell out of me when Evan texted me at 1.30 in the morning and said, hey, we just signed TJ Ward. But a really, really, a really, really good asset for this defense. How do you guys think he's going to fit in this year? Evan, go ahead, man. Uh, yeah, I, I think I, I, I like the fit. Um, it's going to take him a little bit. And actually that's one of my pros that I'm going to give. Um, and I'm going to give in a little bit is that TJ Ward now will probably start, uh, that, that week two game, uh, um, against the Chicago bears because he does have time to, to learn the playbook and Mike Smith's defense to me, uh, and just, just the sense I get from the players, because, you know, um, me, me and Trevor were, were talking about this before the show went on and, Obviously, we're we're Trevor's an insider, but we're outsiders looking in, and uh, I try to get as much info as I can. So, like, I, I watch all the press conferences every day; they they're available. Um, you know, I, I try to read some some transcripts, and uh, you know, and the the players just it seemed like Mike Smith's defense is complicated, but once you get it, you got it. And TJ Ward is is. is He's going to need some time. Uh, I believe, obviously, he practiced on Monday a little. Probably didn't do too much. But um, then I believe they practiced today, right, Trevor? Uh, they did practice today, yes. Okay, so I believe probably TJ Ward probably did practice today. He's a hard hitter. Uh, he's not the best in card, but you know, he makes up for it. And is down playing. When he got very happy. They said, lead on field and a great player. And then Jared comes out in his first press conference. So, uh, players weren't happy. He's a board something. Um, 
So obviously the player can be a fan. When they get upset about a player leaving, that means that a team is a pretty good football player. And, you know, you got um, the biggest Sean Jackson. Obviously, that's his belief. So, uh, that DJ Ward, uh, DJ Ward, big part <laughs> Well, fifth, Cam Newton had a four and seven tackles. In. So, I think the fit's good. And, you know, I don't get all the Chris Conti hate. Um, I don't think he's terrible. Now, is he the best? No, so certainly not. He's certainly not the best. I think Keith Tandy's better, but I think that it should be Tandy and Ward, but right now it seems like they're going to roll with Conti and, and Ward. Uh, we shall see, but, uh, yeah, I think it's really beneficial to TJ Ward and also beneficial to the Bucks because, you know, they brought him in here for an immediate upgrade, and I think that's what he's going to give. And uh, really quick, you had talked about TJ Ward and his tackling ability. He'll fit in awesome as you said before, in the strong safety position. And that was, we brought it up plenty of times over the preseason. One of the biggest concerns was open field tackling, one-on-one -on -one tackling. We don't have a lot of guys who can go downhill and make the play when they have to. We have a lot of guys that can be in the right place at the right time, but not make the tackle, therefore not making the play. But TJ Ward is a great hitter. As you said, great open field downhill tackler. Uh, that's something I'm really looking forward to out of TJ Ward in that position. But you said you don't get the hate on Chris Conti. Let me tell you why I hate Chris Conti, okay? I don't I don't hate the guy by any means, actually. Let me take that statement back. But <laughs> let me tell you why I am distasteful about Chris Conti, okay? He lost us a couple of games. You can't deny the fact that he lost us But he us won a the Kansas games. City game. But he won the Kansas City game. He lost us a couple games. Here, Here's my thing. Here's my thing. I... I believe he – did he delete his Instagram? Do either uh, – do you guys know if he deleted his Instagram? Because I know I know he was uh, I know he was a staple on Instagram about a year ago. Um, uh, I, I believe his Instagram is still White Unicorn 23 or whatever it is. I remember I, – I believe it used to be – I think it was – I think it was one bird, two stones, or two birds, one stones. or I think it was two bird, three stones. That's what it was because he's number 23. Yeah. Um, and I had followed him on Instagram for a very, very long time. And in my opinion, it, there was just something about the guy. He had an attitude about him. He was very rude to fans in the comments. And I had made a post one day. It was after I was at work, so I honest to God can't even remember which game it was, which is sad because he lost us a few games. But it was one of the games that he had lost us. And I had posted on my Instagram – uh, it was just a picture, and on the picture it said, hashtag release Chris Cont, or release Chris Conti. So, a couple hours go by, hashtag release Chris Conti, a lot of people are liking it, a lot of people are commenting on it, and he liked it, and he commented a heart, and I had to delete the picture, because I just couldn't, I don't know, he ruined me that day. I, I didn't <laughs> think he would get the best of me after I tried to shut him down, but that's why I hate him, is because he made me look stupid, but, <laughs> uh, you know... Look at it preseason. He was one of the guys out there making plays. You can't deny that. He has definitely, definitely grown as a player. Not that he was a rookie by any means, but he is definitely. It, it almost seems like environmental awareness just kind of, uh, kind of clicked over the off season. I don't know what it was, what they drilled into his head at training camp, but I hope the guy's in the right place at the right time this year. I'm looking forward to seeing him make plays. I, I really want to like him, but as of right now, he's kind of. He, he's kind of in the middle of my scale. But I'm just telling you that I know his attitude. His attitude was very arrogant at a time. That's why I didn't know if he had deleted his Instagram or not. Yeah, it's, you know, I've, I've had problems with him in the past too. But, you know, he, he seems like an all right guy. Um, Trevor, your thoughts on the whole uh, TJ Ward thing? I know you actually said uh, on, on Twitter that uh, I believe, uh, well, obviously a bunch of fans asked you, but um, – that if they should sign T.J. Ward or not. And, and you said, should they? Yes. But will they? You didn't think so. Why didn't you think so? Um, so, you know, this is my first year on the beat, and I'm still learning to, uh, let's just say I'm still learning to call out Jason Light and Dirk Cutter's bluff. And 
uh, throughout training camp. I know they liked a lot of their guys on their team. Um, they obviously had the signing of J.J. Wilcox this offseason. Uh, they had, you know, Tandy playing well, Conti playing better, and then obviously drafting Justin Smith where they did. And it was kind of the same thing with uh, with the Joe Hayden and LaShawn McCoy thing. You know, somebody said to me, hey, should they trade for LaShawn McCoy? He's only, you know, it'll only cost you a fourth rounder. And I kind of uh, broke it down this way, and I was like, a savage about it sure they can trade a first round pick for him play him for the first three games as the feature starting running back and if he plays fine you cut doug martin and you have shady mccoy so you can do that if you want to be a savage about it but i didn't think that jason light was going to be a savage because they have committed to doug martin this entire offseason i didn't think that they were going to do that to them in terms of tj ward you're right when somebody tweeted at me should they pick him up i said absolutely they should yes make the phone call but i didn't think that they would because again Safety safety was one of the more shallow positions going into the offseason, and it's one of the positions that they did the most work on. So I thought that they were going to still give plenty of time to see it play out. Now, I will say this. You know, when we asked, uh, you know, guys in the front office of the coaching staff, you know, hey, how's J.J. Wilcox doing since you signed him? J.J. made quite a few plays in the preseason training camp. Man, I, I, I'm just going to be honest here. I did not. I was not on the same page with the coaches in the front office when they told me, "Eh, you know, JJ's uh, he's having a hard time picking it up, but he's learning." And they were kind of a little, you know, negative on him picking it up. And I'm over here like, dude, this is his this is his first like two months in the system, and he's making plays. You know, he I think he led the team in interceptions during camp. You know, so just yeah, you're uh, teaching Jeff. just a quick side note. Sorry to interrupt. He actually did get me. Uh, I counted. He did get me three pick sixes in Madden uh, online head to head. So I, I can credit him for that. Chris Conti didn't there, do that for me either. There we go too. And the coaching staff just takes him away from you. How dare they, you know? Um, but, but uh, you know, so it turned out that now he does but the deep something but it is a much more kind of sit back um you know you wait take your chances and strike when you do your work the week before in the playbook and anticipation and reading your quarterbacks and all that stuff so it is people said that you know there are similar things even tj ward said there are similar things between tampa and denver but i will just go on record and say that the nature of the defenses and the attitude of the defenses are not the same they're at least not right now and perhaps the reason why you bring ward in is because that's where you want to go you want to have a team and a secondary and a defense that has you know the mantra of yo we're a no fly zone and you know the whole thing between him and the keep to was you get 10 points you're not getting more than 10 points our offense is going to score more than 10 that's fine they're, 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 we're going to win every game we're going to go 16 and 0 you get 10 points that's it and that was the mantra in denver and to be honest man i've never seen anything like that in tampa i've never heard anything like that and not, not to say that these guys don't want to win or that they don't have confidence or things like that, but Denver, Seattle, these lockdown defenses, these kind of cover three defenses instead of more cover two, they got a little bit of a different swagger to them, and so that's what I'm most interested in. He has plenty of talent, but it's about fitting in in that certain way. Yeah, definitely. Um, now, I mean, we have heard that T.J. Ward would possibly be paired with Chris Conti. Um Mm-hmm. Is there any 
you know, do you know the the thought process b- b- behind that move? I mean, what, do you think that Ward would fit better with Conti than he would with Tandy? Um, I mean, if you're asking me my opinion, I think Tandy should absolutely be the starting free safety of this team because of how well he played in a free safety and a deep coverage role last year. You know, four picks in five games. That's He paid his due. He had a success. And so over the offseason, he gained 10 pounds, and they started playing him a lot more strong safety. And... I didn't like it, and here we are. And if you, I mean, if you're asking me what I think the starting lineup is going to be, I think it's going to be Ward and Conti, just from what I've heard and the way that they want to run things. And uh, in my opinion, that's the wrong move. I think Tandy and Ward are your two starters, but um, they seem to be using Tandy in a different way. Hmm. I mean, you know, <laughs> just to just to clear up, you know, I I, I pretty much know, but just, but just to clear up for. Um, a lot of fans. Why is it does it does this team like Chris Conti? Because you know when I when I tell people that you know well the two starting safeties were likely Conti and Tandy. This is before the Ward signing, and they said, oh no, what about JJ Wilcox? And you know when Ward got signed, they said, oh well, you know you can cut Conti. Like the Conti hate is is so bad, and yeah. I just yeah. I just don't know. You know I know what the team sees in Conti because you know I you know I don't watch extensive film but I, I do watch some film like um i go i i do like to go over every game uh including preseason so um i i watch it once and then i go over it again and uh you know i don't hate conti but i don't really like him either what what is this team really like about chris conti that is essentially i mean they gave him a, they didn't have to bring him back this off season and they did yeah, um, I, I really think it's got to be, it's just consistency. And don't get me wrong, man, you know, Conti's an athletic dude. He can play safety, but I, he's a, he's a, I think he's a backup safety in the NFL. And that's, you know, it's okay. You're, you, you can have a long career as a backup. And even as a, you know, a, a spot starter, you know, if one of the two guys go down, Candy or Conti can play either free safety or strong safety. But I, I mean, I just think that they seem to think that either Conti's ceiling is higher than it is or that he has achieved a ceiling currently that is like going to come around eventually and it's going to pay off, and it has yet to. Um, you know, the fans plenty of times remember the blown coverages that he's had. You know, for example, the Oakland Raiders game where he was getting cooked by Amari Cooper or the Arizona game where he got cooked by John mm. Brown in the middle there. But, um, you know, I, I'll just say this, and – it's true. I don't mean for it to be a sound like a cop out, but I don't know exactly what coverages are going on every play. You know, I can study mm-hmm. all the film that I want, and I can be like, "Well, he I, he should have been here." But ultimately, there is so much communication and chemistry with playing safety that it's that it makes it difficult. However, in the Jacksonville game, if you'll remember, Vernon Hargraves got beat two times in the end zone, and the wide receiver dropped that. You guys remember that? Uh, it was yep. Allen Robinson and Keenan Cole. If you guys watched that, so I went back yep. and I watched the game. And Hargraves actually has his body turned to the outside. And if you'll remember, both of those routes that beat Hargraves were post routes. But he had his man to the outside, and it was actually Conti who was slow to get over there. And so that's the thing, man. If you want to say that we love him because he's, he's reliable, he's got consistency, he knows how to play free and strong safety, that's fine. But... There's got to be somebody better than him as a starter. And if he is a backup, I am totally fine with Chris Conti being a rotational backup. You know, I'm totally fine with that. But you've got to you've got to be honest with yourself and, and, and tell yourself, especially at free safety, that you can get somebody who can play the ball a little bit better than he can. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I was surprised that they gave him uh, an extension, especially a two-year deal. But, I mean, to, to his defense in that Oakland game, something happened. Um, you know, in, in no way is Amari Cooper going to be matched up one on one with safety, right? Uh, you know, right. yeah. I mean, something, something that that was and that was one of the communication issues they had. There was no possible way that a Mar- Amari Cooper, in my opinion, a top fifteen, maybe even top ten receiver in the NFL, um, is going to get matched up with Chris Conti one on one or, or any safety. I mean. There's only a few safeties in the NFL that would, that would have been able to handle that. Yep. No, I'm with you. It's a, um, yeah. I mean, that's that's my thoughts on Tandy. I think he's a backup player. I think he'd be a high variance backup player, but I do think that he is a backup player. And, well, and I mean, sorry about with, that. Go ahead. 
No, sorry, I just want to make one more point. With Tandy becoming a free agent at the meeting, 28 years old, I believe, uh, or about to turn 28, who knows? Um, you know, I wouldn't mind bringing him back, but I, I also think, you know, if, if EJ Ward produces, they're going to try to bring him back. And uh, unless Brent Grimes, uh, you know, just like retires, I seem to think that if Brent Grimes produces, they're going to try to bring him back for at least one year. And I, I believe that. So I think there's a lot of uncertain, uncertainty in the safety position right now. Um, I didn't know if Brent wanted to move on, but he's really been killing here, but uh, that pretty much my thought. Well, Jim, the only thing I was going to say, you brought up Brent Grimes, if you were just drop and retire, or even go down and get hurt, and we were totally in there, throw some pads in there. She's, she's got a proven <laughs> ability to get in there and know what's going on. Um, but guys, the addition of TJ Ward I think would be very, very exciting this coming season. Now the Buccaneers are set to play 16 straight, but we can't do anything about it. Moving on, we are going to talk about week one, official week one. It is okay. Actually, let me clarify that real quick. The home opener, our first game, is going to go down as week two, correct? Correct. So yes. if you have if you have any bucks on your starting lineup for week one fantasy, you were just your SOL at this point, right? Which I do. <laughs> Yikes. I, 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 have J- I have Jameis Winston and I have Jarvis Landry. So I had to take Jameis Winston and Jarvis Landry both out. So it, this week should be fun. It, it was Not a move. Great. It was a move that hurt my heart, but I did have to start Eric Decker over uh, over Deshaun Jackson this week. That one really killed me. But I, I did throw in uh I, I did throw in the Texans defense over the Bucks. Um so I didn't feel too bad about that. I got two pretty good defenses. The Bucks were my bench, but I think I'll be switching back and forth throughout the season. We'll see how it goes, man. But uh, Evan, do you know who you play week one? Uh, I think I play Morgan. Morgan? Yeah, and, and he's with, he's without Mike Evans, so. Oh man, it's gonna be a slow week for everybody in our league because I know at least everyone in that draft got one or two pretty notable bucks, some way somehow. Mm-hmm. But moving on, guys, we are gonna talk about that Chicago game. It's gonna be week two, the home opener. And let's just talk about it really quick. Let's get a little bit of uh, let's get a little bit of pregame analysis. What you guys expect to see? What you guys expect to see that's good? What you guys might expect to see that's bad? I can say right up front all the thoughts that I had on the game. I pretty much said in the season predictions live stream. Uh, I think this is going to be definitely one of our easiest games of the year. Now that we're a week out from being conditioned in game day conditions, it might be a little bit more of a sloppy game when it comes to starting the season in Ray J a week behind everyone else. But it will be a well-rested team and a team without a doubt that's been in the uh, that's been in the film room taking a look at everything just with the extra time that they do have on their hands. Uh, I think the Bucks are going to come in here and just and dominate the Bears. To be honest, I, I hate to say that without bias, I think it's going to be a very very one-sided football game. You want to you want to go, Trevor? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I mean the Bears are they're they're a younger team. They have a younger core, um, especially with Mitchell Trubisky, who is really their future quarterback. But Glennon was, I think, named a captain of the Bears this week, so you know they're not going to pull him after huh. week one, even if he doesn't, uh, even if he doesn't perform well. Um, or I'm sorry, you know they're not going to pull him in week two, even if he doesn't perform well in week one, but. This is, I, I mean, come on. This has got to be a cake matchup for them. C- certainly, the Bears have some talent on their roster, but um, no more Alshon Jeffrey, no Cam Meredith at wide receiver. They're relying on um, some unknowns from Kevin White, obviously unknowns from Kendall Wright because he's been bouncing around in the NFL. Glennon's with a brand-new team. Both of their tackles are a little bit shaky, so the defensive pass rush should have a, should have a confidence-building uh, first game there. And then... And the defense, they should they should know exactly what they're getting from Glennon because he ain't any different. You know, this is the same mm-hmm. guy that's been with the Bucks for I don't know what, what was it four years, five years, whatever it was. And so four, yeah. This is this is a. I know people are complaining that, that they're getting time off this week, but when you get extra time off to prepare for an opponent that you already know, the win percentage of this game, in my opinion, just shot up. And if it is a game that they drop, um. That's not good. And I know in the NFL, any team can win every week. I get that. But this is, like you said earlier, 
it is a tough schedule. This is one of their easier games, and this is at home. So they need to win this game. I think that that's this is almost this is almost as must win as you could get. Um, instead of mm-hmm. starting the season on the road, you get to start it at home. You get to set the tone. You get to you know come back in a couple weeks and go, hey, we're undefeated at home. Let's keep it going. You know all this kinds of stuff. So uh, I think mentality plays a big role into that. And I just think the outside factors. You know the Bears have talent in certain places, but I mean we're 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 babying this Bucks team if we think that they can't beat the Chicago Bears. And and you did bring yeah, up... Yeah, and I uh, mean... I, sorry about that. Sorry, you can, you can go ahead. Uh, you did bring up, you know, looking to highlight that that pass rush. No matter who the Bears have in at quarterback, whether it is Trubisky or Glennon, whoever gets the start, it will be challenging for either of those guys. I, I mean, maybe not so much Glennon. He, he's more of a check-down player, as we've seen plenty of times mm-hmm. in Tampa. Uh, so I can't see him having any trouble at least picking up a few first downs. But you talked about building some confidence in that pass rush. Smacking the hell out of your former quarterback is definitely a surefire way to build some confidence in that pass rush. As you said, Chicago does have some shaky tackles. Look to take advantage of that. But on the other side of the spectrum, if Trubisky does go in and get a good chunk of playing time, I said it before, this is going to be without a shadow of a doubt, one of the one of the tougher secondaries that he's going to go up against if this secondary does come in and, and be as good as they are on paper. You have TJ Ward on one side, Chris Conti if he gets the start on the other side, lockdown corners all over the field. This secondary and the linebacker core is going to be all over Mitch Trubisky, and it's going to be a very, very hard day for him to throw the football uh, if this defense is on point, so really, just a- as you said, a very solid, a very solid look for Tampa Bay all around. Yep, no, I'm totally with you on the matchups and everything. So it's actually should be a good confidence builder, and the extra time that they have off, hey, it's just more time for T.J. Ward to get in the playbook. It's mm-hmm. more time for Adam Humphries to get healthy. It's mm-hmm. more time for Jock Smith to get healthy. So there you go. Oh uh, yeah, I didn't even think about the. Uh, I didn't even think about Jack Smith. So yeah, that would be that'd be very good. Uh, you want to talk about? Uh, helping out the pass rush. I mean, yeah, you know, he, he, has a, he has a lot of potential. Oh, they definitely need pass rush. Uh, I think that's probably their their biggest. If if there was one thing that could keep them from the playoffs, I think it's the pass rush, in, in, in my opinion. But, uh, Trevor, you did mention that they are without Cameron Meredith. Cameron Meredith, last season, was the only bear to catch a touchdown pass in Tampa. And that 30 On that Hail Mary, Mary, right? Yep. I, oh, my God. And and it bounced right off of Chris Conti's hands. Um, <laughs> you know, I don't understand. <laughs> hey, hey, also, you know, I'm glad you remember. So, so, I'm glad that, you did remember that it was Chris Conti's hands. I I also remember that the Bucks started off very cool that game. The second start that was the Chris Conti pick six, which was a, a, you know it was a great read. Uh, had the color, but. Uh, Good read. Uh, yeah, I, I agree with you guys. Uh, this team, speaking of the Bucks, this team should um, very easily beat the Bears. Uh, I do think the Bears are a bit improved from last year, but uh, you know, I think the Bucks are, are are improved as well. So I think this should be similar to last year's game, uh, maybe a bit closer. Uh, just because it is the Bucks it would be the Bucks' first game, and I think that it will be a bit sloppy as we've seen as we've seen in the past. I mean, the Bucks have uh, not really gotten off to the fastest of starts lately. I mean, I know last year they did win Week One at Atlanta, but that was the first time they won Week One in 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 three seasons since uh, you know 2012 versus Carolina. Uh, 2013 actually. Uh, was the uh, Levante David pushing Geno Smith out of bounds and Nick Folk hitting the game-winning field goal for, for the Jets. So uh, hopefully he gets a couple of game winners for the Bucks. And uh, really, I have to agree. I mean, I don't. Mitch Trubisky's not going to start that game. Uh, it's going to be Mike Glennon. And then just like Trevor said, Mike Glennon should um, not have a, <laughs> the best day in the world, and the Bucks should know what Glennon's going to do. And I think it's it's an advantage of Glennon plays. I think it's an advantage to the Bucks because I think that if if the checkdown isn't there, Glennon may throw it away a couple times. But we all know Glennon doesn't have the mobility, and Trubisky has much better mobility 
than uh, than Mike Glennon does. So I think in terms of avoiding a pass rush, Trubisky is better. So I think that could really benefit the Bucks pass rush. But um, I think Jameis Winston, he'll do all right. I think he's going to rely on Cameron Braid again because Cameron Braid was a big part of that uh, Chicago win. He, he sure. believe, believe, I believe he caught a touchdown and uh, had a couple of, of other nice catches. Uh, I remember there was, uh, there was a Chicago defender draped all over him. He still caught it. Um, I believe it drew a flag also. So he had a nice day. Um, O.J. Howard, you know, a, a lot of people DM me and, and ask me. And the expectations, I people, people are going to be calling – O.J. Howard a bust after the season. Uh, and I think it's because the expectations of the fans are that he's going to come in and just dominate guys. And and that's that's not going to happen, especially because, in my mind, Brate's the starter. Brate's tight end one. Uh, Howard's tight end two, even though they do do a lot of uh, two tight end sets. Um, rookie tight ends typically don't start off fast. And, you know, you look at history, they normally blossom in their second or third year. So um, they definitely have to, definitely have to, I mean, OJ's going to have to adjust the NFL. I mean, you know, Godwin's going to struggle as well. They have to adjust. So, but, you know, just to get back to it, I do think the Bucks win. Uh, I do think it'll be a closer game, but ultimately uh, the Bucks win, start off uh, 1-0. And it, it, I agree with, with, with Trevor, you have to win this game. Um, if you don't win this game, and and let's say you do go eight and eight or nine and seven this season, uh, this could be the, basically like the Rams game last year. Uh, the Rams game last year that was inexcusable. Uh, the Rams were awful, and you should have beat them. That was uh, there was no excuse not to beat them. They were they were you know I mean they hadn't scored a touchdown two games. They scored a touchdown on the opening drive. Um, so yeah. If if they lose this game, there there is some some trouble in Tampa. And I mean, after this game, they have a tough stretch. Go on the road to Minnesota. Minnesota's a good team, although you know I do think the Bucks have a good chance to win. Uh, and then they play New York at home, the Giants, and then the Patriots. And we all know that uh, you know Giants and Patriots are are no easy task. So they definitely definitely need to start off fast here. And and I I do think they will. Um, one thing I'm going to ask Trevor is. I'm a bit concerned about maybe the – not really – well, concern's a wrong word. I guess – well, I guess it is because I was, the other one I was going to use was worried. So um, <laughs> <laughs> it's basically the same thing. Um, about, you know, the defense maybe showing some signs, you know, early in the season of, of what they did last year, and maybe it takes them a, a few weeks to, to figure it out. How do you think this defense – performs against the bears uh obviously not this sunday but it would be next sunday um you know obviously i think they're fortunate that they get to start the season the way that they do now um in that sense you know there are other outside factors where you could say well you know fortunate doesn't really matter but in terms of this in terms of starting off the season getting a chemistry i think this is a good matchup to get your you know get your feet wet and they you know it doesn't get any easier right after that they go against minnesota who's gonna have a good running game with dalvin cook um sam bradford's it uh, serviceable quarterback, and so had to make sure I start uh, him week one too. And then uh, <laughs> you know after that they're playing the Giants, and it's uh, it's full force. It's one of the best receiving cores in the NFL. So it kind of accelerates pretty quick, and then obviously after that you got the Patriots. I don't know if I would say I'm worried, and I guess the reason why I can't say that is because you just I mean you don't know. I mean, really, um, and I'm not trying to take this like an offensive way or anything like that uh, to your opinion and the words that you have. That's not really something to worry about because either, like, you know, either play on the team have played together four years now, um, and they've been under my for the second year. So if they're a little bit of a slow start, I, I mean, it happens. But that's what you worried about just because there are so many factors. One, going against it, and two, you just, you just don't know. And that's the coach, you know, that's the preseason game. They're like, look, you can judge preseason games and preseason results, stats, but you want, but until you until you strap up with one, you go up against a running, pushing, doing whatever he can to win a football game that matters. You know, um, you know Ed, that's what I'm concerned about because it's such a such a something can be uh, worried about. It. You just you just know. Yeah, I mean, and the other thing, I mean, I know. 
Uh, the discussion is just pretty basic because I just asked him about defense. But I think this is obviously the more important defense that um, I'm sure we'll probably move on and um, wrap up the show. Um, how do you think this is going to perform? Because defense is real. Uh, I've seen people every day on Good Morning Football. I watched the morning. Great show. Shout out to everybody involved there. Um, that's a dark word. And, and you know, there's there is a last night on the NFL Power Rank show, same same game as go for 40 plus touchdowns. There's a lot of hype about this offense. And to me, offense is is a lot is big on chemistry. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that if you have great chemistry, you can have the best offense. Uh, you know, if your receivers are locked in with the quarterback, O line's locked in. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, o lines locked in with each other. You can you can have uh, a lot of success. So, how do you think this offense is going to perform? Because honestly, I think I think they get off to a bit of a slow start, but maybe in the second half to start to pick things up. Um, yeah, it's uh, this is kind of where the rubber meets the road, right? Because you look at it in the very first two games that the first team actually played, and granted, it was the first game action they've had of 2016. Efficiency was off the charts. I mean, against Cincinnati and against uh, and against Jacksonville, they had the team in field goal or at least like some kind of points range on a really high percentage of their drives, and got even to like some you know first and goal on a lot of their drives. And some of these drives, you know, they weren't easy. They were 80, 90, you know, sixty whatever yards to get down there. And, and you you watch them use a variety of different weapons. Um, stick out there with you know dual tight ends and not a lot of substitutions and play players who can be versatile and all this kind of stuff and so you know not sticking it in the end zone is a bit concerning but I'm not really worried about that for them because the process was working it, they were getting down uh-huh. to the goal line and into the red zone and if you do that that means that you know that red zone offense it's just about executing what you need to execute and finding the mismatches that you need to find so. Yeah. You know, when, when you hear people say, Jameis is going to throw for 40 touchdowns, going to be a dark horse MVP candidate, is it possible? Certainly it's possible, but I also think we've got to be honest with who Jameis Winston is. He is a high-variance quarterback. He throws touchdowns and he throws interceptions, and the only year he has ever not done that was the year he won the Heisman at Florida State. He threw 40 touchdowns and nine interceptions. Every other year he has played football, he has had a high touchdown um, total, and a high interception total. And that's just who Jameis Winston is. And so if you want to bet on Jameis Winston, throwing 40 touchdowns, winning MVP, you can. Because this is the best offense that he has ever had in his life. However, he will have to become a quarterback that he has rarely been yet in his career. And that is a much more efficient quarterback, more higher percentage throws, and better completions down the field. And I, you just have to be honest with yourself. You can, you can be, say that Winston has all the talent in the world, and he does. But in order for you to achieve that MVP season that people are talking about, he has to be a quarterback that we really have not seen yet from Winston. Uh, I was really yeah. hoping you weren't going to say that he has to be a, a Rose Bowl caliber quarterback because God knows I don't want to see that again. I thought that was where that conversation was going. He said, we need to see something from him that we don't always see, and I've only seen that from him one time. So, but right, right. Glad to hear about Jameis Winston. I do know whenever I listen to, uh, whenever I listen to the sports shows down here, 620, I, I like listening to those guys in the afternoon when I drive home. I like listening to the games even more when they have them on 98 Rock um, because it's so much. It, it sounds so much better. But I, you listen to the shows in the afternoon and you listen to the critique of Jameis Winston from anybody, from any of the people who want to come out and talk about the, the critical points of Jameis Winston. Uh, the top of the list, as you brought up, were those – those red zone turnovers, uh, not mm-hmm. being able to score in the red zone. And I know that was a, a point of, I wouldn't say worry, but a point of concern that a lot of people brought up throughout the preseason. Um, and you kind of you hit the nail right on the head, Trevor. Uh, not much I can say about that. I just kind of wanted to put my two cents in, I guess, to show that I was listening. I guess I did my job then. I did yeah. good. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yep. <laughs> so we are talking Bears. One last thing we'll talk about, and then uh, I have a quick little announcement thing at the end of the show. Um, and we'll keep it short and sweet. Who is your breakout star of the year for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers? Oh, uh, somebody go before me. Let me think about it. Evan, you're okay. up. Okay. Well, all right. Well, I know Trevor. 
Trevor's really gonna like this one. Okay. I'm gonna go. For, I'm gonna go Vernon Hargraves. Oh and, my boy! Um, think you're gonna be a pick machine this year. <laughs> I yeah. I think I'm not only a pick machine, but I just think he's gonna play with such more confidence. And I mean, he says, you know, well, I was playing with confidence, you know. But we could all see on the film, and he was passive last year. He didn't want. He didn't want to take a chance to, to get burned. And, and this year, he I mean, he's going to get burned sometimes. I honestly think he's almost identical to Brent Grimes. He's going to get burned sometimes, but he's also going to make the, you know, fantastic plays like the play he made uh, in Cincinnati preseason week one. I mean, you couldn't have done that. You couldn't have played that any better um, as, as a cornerback. I, I think Vern Harvey, like, we got one last year, four or five. Five from this year. I, I think uh, plus a lot of players. I think Vernon, uh, Vernon has a chance. I think Brent Grimes and Vernon Hargreaves have a chance to be a top ten uh, cornerback. Um, Trevor, you got enough time? Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> to me, the Hargreaves thing, I'll tell you too. Uh, I just made a bet with uh, my editor, Mark, today, and uh, Hargreaves would have more picks than Brent Grimes, and he said Brent Grimes would have more picks than Brent We'll see. Ooh. Well, I mean, Cook is an FSU fan, you know. He's an FSU fan. Well, he's not a boy as much as me. Um, <laughs> oh, okay. okay. Is the question, like, who's the, like, the standout player? Who do you think, do you think is going gonna, to gonna come out from the work? You know, someone who has been poised to be a star on the team who is almost there, but it, I, I wouldn't say wasn't quite. Just someone that's going to come out and really carry the load to do well for the team. Like last year, there were a ton of people at the end of the year who Alexander was out over the two years without a doubt. Yeah, yeah that's not even fair. It's not even a France. It's red. It's you know who's doing for Brent's season? It's not Quan Alexander. No, dude. He had it. Back. You, uh, you missed it. You missed it. I, I was reporting on it back then. You know, I, I wish that I could take it in. I just don't know if he's going to start. I love to see Tandy at the Finley for four years. He to shine last year and start to roll. He did really well. And so he's going to take that next step. I um, have a lot of good communication. He could be safety. But I guess outside of that, let me say that it's going to be our clan. Yeah. Corner because I am. I am I'm, been so impressed with that guy during practice, and I'm going to say this too. I've also been impressed with Jake. So if they get Kelly playing time, that is what it is, and and maybe my guess turns out to be wrong, but I think that's because both of these guys have been playing really well, and you can see from McLean that he still has that athleticism, but he's also got that veteran mentality, knowing when to break on routes, how to defend certain passes, and so I'll yeah, I'll, I'll make him my guess just because I know he's a new guy, but. I liked a lot from what I saw of him in practice, and and I'll tell you this too: JV and Elliot was playing really, really well in practice, and I didn't think that this was going to be a debate of who was going to be the starting slot corner. And then McLean played <laughs> really, really mm-hmm. well, so now it is a debate. So I'll, I'll say him. I'll go outside of the box and say McLean. Okay. All right, I got one. I got one last question for Trevor, and it's about probably one of my favorite players on the team because I watched all of his film when he was in college. I loved him. I actually wanted the Bucks to pick him at nine. Bucks got him in the second round. No, I'm not talking about Roberto Aguayo. Uh, I'm talking about Noah Spence. Uh, over, under, Noah Spence, eight sacks this season. Oh, you're going to hate me, but under. Oh. I, I will expound upon that by saying this. You know, During the preseason, I thought that we were going to see a much more explosive Noah Spence, and there are things that Noah Spence is doing better this year. There really are, but... I wonder if he really has the bend as a pass rusher, just physically. And and this is rare, man. We are talking about, you know, when we talk about Von Miller, Khalil Mack, and Vic Beasley, we're talking about the upper echelon of athletes in the world. And I wonder if Noah Spence has that body bend like those guys to really get near that double that double digit sack rate. Because in the preseason, I saw him not really be able to get off blocks. I know he lost a little weight, he got a little faster, but if he can't bend, what does that speed matter? So um, maybe I'm being a little bit of a hater here, but I will just I will say that Noah Spence does not eclipse eight sacks this year. Yikes! Very very interesting. Well, I mean, you know, it to me 
I'm not exactly obviously sacks. You know, this team needs a ten sack guy. Um, sure, you know, or else we'll never hear about it. Uh, you know, we will never hear the end of it. I should say. And I seriously think that Gerald McCoy has a chance, uh, as he does every year. But um, I seriously think that. I think the defensive line is slightly improved, uh, especially if Jack Smith can stay healthy. Um, talent, I think Jack talent wise, talent wise, I'm totally with you. And t- granted, we have not seen a defensive lineup with Spence and Jock Smith and Baker and McCoy on there at once yet. And so, you know, it's a little bit. Yeah, I'm, I'm worried about the pass rush, and that's probably why I have my um, my hesitations with calling Spence a, a more than ten sack guy because or an eight sack guy because we're talking about double digits at that point, but. Yeah, I gotta, I gotta, uh, I gotta call it like I see him. I don't know. Yeah, and yeah, I, you know, and and I understand. I mean, it's all scary is uh, his shoulder. Um, that's definitely a, a concern. But uh, you know, he see he's a really tough kid. I mean, there's you know, there's, I mean, maybe, <laughs> I mean, you know, you you, uh, I I I know you like tough guys because uh, I I was I was seeing some of your tweets. Uh, I was seeing some of your tweets on the floor. Florida State game, and, and you yeah. just you just love you just love uh, DeAndre Francois's toughness, and I yeah. mean, yeah, um, there some guys have it, some guys don't, and I think Noah Spence definitely has it. No, I'm I'm totally with I'm totally with you there. I just wonder if Noah Spence is still a year away, um, technique wise, and maybe he's got to put on a little bit more of that weight again to get stronger and get around some of these left tackles and right tackles. So that's my thing. Not that I think that he's going to be a total bust this year. But I think maybe he might be still a year away before he's contending for that ten double digit sack lead. Do you think the Bucks get a ten sack guy this year? Oh, you know what? I'm gonna say I'm gonna say no. And I love McCoy. McCoy was so dominant in the preseason, and he has every chance to. But the thing about McCoy is McCoy is much more. And this is this is with any three three technique defensive tackle. You are much more susceptible to getting tackles for loss than you are sacks, right? Because if you hike mm. the ball and you're getting past your offensive lineman quick, chances are the quarterback's going to chuck that bad boy away. And so you just don't get you don't get a lot of sacks for that production. But you do become a dominant run stuffer, and um, I think he'll get plenty of sacks. Now, I think McCoy is, yeah, he's an 8-9, perhaps 10-sack guy, but I'm just going to say under because I think he's more of a tackle for loss guy, which is totally fine. And people got to realize this, too. I know fans really want a 10-sack thing, but pressure and disruption, it's all about the unit. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter. It really I mean Levante David's a phenomenal blitzer too. So Levante is probably gonna end the year with five, six, seven sacks. You know, Noah might end up with six or seven. And it collectively you're talking about it doesn't matter. So I'll say no on the end sack, but not to say that it can't be good disruption. Um, I mean, and you said about runs, the teams need quickly. I mean, the team to need um, to have uh, an elite, not some of the same elite, elite run set. Like, now, be two. Uh, you know, the Bears are going to the Bucks get up early. I know you guys have um, the other. That uh, the two podcasts you do, yeah, prediction podcast. Uh, all three of those guys are doing a great job, and uh, they, they said on um, the podcast, they said, my, I think it's the same. Chicago, so we're, we're Arizona, like if the Bucks get up 14, you know. I don't see the bus coming off to do fast everything. I mean, Jordan Howard, Jay, now Christian McCaffrey, uh, you know, e- even Adrian Peterson, if he's healthy. There's, there's a lot of talented running backs that they face this season. Red. Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, without a doubt, man, you're talking about working on that uh, working on that run defense, and I apologize. Working on that run defense <laughs> uh, with a lot of teams, actually, and, and you had brought up the point, uh, 
talked about by many before, the Bucks get up 14. Running the ball against that unit pretty much goes out the window. But you look at a lot of elite teams, as mentioned before, the Giants, one of the best receiving trios in the league. That's a versatile team. That's a team to look out for. But that's also a team that might not come out and establish the run right out the gate. But I did want to say the the, the player that I think was going to break out this year, um, we talked about it before, the big man Cam Brait, double-digit touchdowns this year, I'm calling it. Double-digit right, touchdowns. Cam I- Brait is going to pick right back up where he left off last season. It's it's going to be a great year for him. O.J. Howard is going to have a great year behind him. It's not going to be double-digit touchdowns, obviously. It's going to be a rookie tight end season. But definitely going to be a great addition to the blocking front when running that two tight end set that Dirk Cutter does like to run. And it'll be a great plug, and Cam Brake going to have a great year. And I'm not going to say this other guy, it's all offensive, I guess. I'm not going to say he's going to explode, but I think he's going to come up just where we need him, and that is Chris Godwin. I would really, really like to see Chris Godwin come up and just and do what needs to be done, and I think he has the ability to do that. He showed he had playmaking ability through a couple of snaps he had in the preseason. The guy's got talent without a doubt. Now it's just time to see if he can back it up, and I think he does have the ability to back it up this season. Yeah, definitely. Um, I definitely agree. And uh, just wrapping things up, I know that uh, Trevor's schedule with the the whole writing thing is really messed up uh, because of this hurricane. Uh, what can we expect from you, Trevor, on, on a normal game week? Yeah, so, uh, you know, we have the podcast you guys were talking about. We're going to do pre-game and post-game podcasts over at pewterreport.com. Uh, every Tuesday or Wednesday, I, I come out with something called a cover three, and that's where I go – I go pretty in-depth into the X's and O's of, of the week before, and I go over the game and I explain why things happened the way that they did, how they can improve, if they can improve. And so, you know, if you're a film junkie, if you're really looking down to get to um, why things happen the way they do in the game of football instead of just saying the stats, I think the cover three is a pretty good thing for you there. Obviously, the Fab Five that Scott does every Friday is a must-read, and then, you know, all kinds of just content here and there. We're, we're pretty on top of it. I'm... I'm uh, <laughs> I'm never away from my computer and my phone, so if any if any Bucks news drops or any potential rumors here and there, this or that, uh, PeterReport.com is going to be on it. So, um, yeah, that's a that's a weekly thing for us. And uh, Trevor, really quick, man, do you have any social media that uh, you could plug really quick on the show? Because I was actually going to follow you on mine, but I wanted to make sure I was following the uh, wanted to make sure I was following the right uh, Trevor Sycamore. Yeah, yeah. Um, at Tampa Bay Trey T R E is my Twitter handle, and then obviously the Pewter Report account is just at Pewter Report. All right. Anything uh, on Instagram or just Twitter? No, I mean, I, I just have. Uh, I kind of just do a personal Instagram thing. Um, so not as much reporting. Guy, you, you guys kill that, man. I, I just got to say, <laughs> you guys are uh, you guys are killing the game with the Instagram coverage. I don't see anybody doing anything like you guys are doing, and it's uh, it's very unique. And I wanted to make sure that I gave you guys props for that. That's awesome, man. Appreciate all the support we can get nowadays. And really quick, a little announcement I did want to make at the end of the show. If you guys are listening to the podcast and you are in the Riverview, Ruskin, even maybe Bradenton, you could probably make it out. That whole area right there, the 33579 area code. On September 18th, 2017, I'm reading it off of the poster, so some information has been updated. And and you'll see what I mean in a minute. Uh, on September 18th, 2017, there is a Meet the Bucks event at the Beef O'Brady's on 13326 Lincoln Road in Riverview, Florida. That's five minutes right up the road from where I live. I'm going to make sure that I'm there. For a comp ticket, which includes a signature from all three players, uh, two players, um, it'll be 59 bucks. I believe dinner is included. I'll have dinner laid out. You can get dinner with the players there. From 6 to 7 p.m., Jeremy Mitchell is going to be there. He's probably not going to show. I'm just calling it right now. Uh, Jeremy McNichol will not show. I don't know what it is. It's just something about that kind of his attitude. I feel like to sniff you guys. But 7 p.m., Brett and Adam Humphries will be up there signing autographs, taking pictures. Just go up there and shoot shit with some of your favorite Bucks players. It's going to be an awesome opportunity to go eat the guys if you are in the Riverview area. Like I said, I'm going to make sure that I'm there. I'm going to try my best. Sacrifice the right lung if I have to. If I can get Cam Brady or Adam Humphreys just a three second clip of them saying, hey, this is so and so for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, and you're listening to the Cannon Fire podcast, I, I, I'm done. I 
I'd have reached, uh, I'd have reached my climax of the season. I wouldn't need anything else, especially King Murray. If he's going to come and put up double digit touchdowns this year, it's going to be it's going to be one hell of an intro. But just something to keep, uh, just something to keep your eyes open about, guys. If you are in that area, and Riverview really isn't, but thirty maybe forty minute drive from Tampa, if you're to the West Tampa downtown area. Up on the cross town, you're there in fifteen minutes, but you, get, you have to pay that two dollars, and that adds up quickly. But, anyways, guys, uh, Director, thank you so much for being on the show, man. I'm having you on here today. All the great And, guys, make sure you go to com and the J.S. Tampa, yep, yep. Tampa Bay Trey on Twitter. Yep, TR. Yep. Tampa Bay Trey, TRB at the end on Twitter. That's the full handle, but you guys get the point. <laughs> anyways, ladies and gentlemen, Evan, any last word before we start off, my man? I don't know what guys, if you have a follow his Twitter account, you got to it. Uh, it's pretty funny. It's, it's a pretty fun account. I I appreciate it, guys. Um, uh, it was it was cool getting to be on the show for you guys. All right, man, no problem at all. Looking forward to have you guys and the rest of the Pewter Report on in the future. But until next time, guys, remember Atlanta led by twenty five and go Bucks. We'll see you next week. <laughs>